Hello, welcome to IB Biology. My name is Johanna, and as I've mentioned before, I have no credentials. I am just a student, but these are notes taken from both the official IB Biology book and the notes I've taken from my teacher. So, this is 1.1, Introduction to Cells. The first thing you have to know about cells is cell theory. In cell theory, there are three main assumptions. All organisms are made up of one or more cells. That is the first assumption. The evidence for this mostly just comes with light microscopes and what we were able to see when those came to be. The second assumption is cells are the smallest unit of life. So this one hasn't necessarily been proven, it's just it hasn't been disproven yet. People have been looking in for years into the different parts of cells to seeing if they are living and the answer is just no, they're not. So thus far there hasn't been anything to disprove this. All cells come from pre-existing cells is the last statement. The evidence for this comes from an experiment that a scientist called Pasteur, 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 Pasteur. Turns out, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, I'm not French, I'm very sorry. Um, he is French. And you'll find out more about that experiment in a future chapter. And now that I've presented you with essentially the rules of what a cell is and how cells act, I am here to show you all of the exceptions, because of course there are exceptions. So, the first example I will be going through is the skeletal muscle cell. This cell has fibers in it, and the fibers are enclosed in a membrane. And this cell is multinucleated, which essentially means that there are multiple nucleuses within the cytoplasm. This is obviously not typical because most cells are not multinucleated. The second exception we will be discussing is the aseptate fungal hypae. So, this fungi consists of narrow thread-like structures called hypae. So, the exception when it comes to this is that it has a continuous cytoplasm and there are no separating walls. So this is yet another example of a multi-nucleated cell. I remember this exception by thinking about the word aseptate, because a means not and septate means separate, so not separated. The third exception is a type of giant algae. This giant algae is unicellular, but you can still find samples of it that is up to a hundred millimeters long. So that is essentially one cell that is a hundred millimeters long, which is very atypical for cells. So an important thing about cells is that cells are living. And the reason why we consider cells to be living is because they carry out all the functions of life. The functions of life are Metabolism, reproduction, sensitivity, homostasis, excretion, nutrition, and growth. My teacher made up this acronym. Well, I don't know if she made it up, but she told us this ac acronym, which was Mr. Sheng, and that's like how we remember that those are the functions of life. So just think every time, if you get a question on the test, what are the functions of life, just think Mr. Sheng. M, metabolism, R, reproduction, so on and so forth. So the reason why I wrote viruses aren't living is because they don't actually carry out the functions of life. Specifically, they cannot reproduce on their own. Metabolism is the chemical reactions taking place in the cell, essentially converting energy. Sensitivity refers to the cell being able to respond to a change in the environment. Homostasis is 
the ability to maintain a stable inner environment. Excretion is the removal of waste products and excess water. I will not be explaining the other ones because they are self-explanatory. So I will be going through two examples of how different types of organisms do the functions of life. So this is a paramecium. Paramecicums are a unicellular, a unicellular organism that is usually found in freshwater environments and they can range from 50 to 300 micrometers. Do you need to know that? No, you just have to know how they do the functions of life. So for excretion, the waste is released over the plasma membrane. In this case, the waste would be CO2. Uh, sensitivity, uh, the cilia allows movement. So these things that are sticking out here, these lines, they are cilia. I am probably pronouncing everything wrong, keep that in mind. So for reproduction, either it uses meiosis or mitosis, um, and the nucleus assists with that action. So for metabolism, this paramecium produces enzymes that start chemical reactions. Nutrition happens in the oral growth for feeding, Homostasis happens because the, I said contractile vacuoles pump out excess water. And the growth, it just grows in general. The second example is the Senedesmus. Don't listen to what I'm saying. Look at what I'm writing. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, so, for the different functions of life, for nutrition, um, it essentially gets its nutrition by photosynthesis. Um, and as you can see, it has a lot of chloroplasts to do that. For excretion, it uses diffusion across the membrane. For Sensitivity, it actually moves in water. It just naturally moves with water. And the reproduction is asexual, and there isn't much to say about the other functions of life. Cell size. As cells get bigger, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. Essentially, all you have to know about this is like too big, too slow. But uh, to go into more depth into that, it's about that when the cell gets too big, there is so much surface area and the cell to move and the cell would need so much energy to move things across the membrane because the membrane would be so long. Another thing that could happen is the cell could overheat and waste production will accumulate and it will make the cell very ineffective. So now we're going into a little bit of a different area with stem cells and stuff. But before we get into that, you have to know about emergent, emergent, emer again, my pronunciation sucks, uh, but emergent properties. This is essentially the idea of the whole is greater than its parts. So multicellular organisms' parts work together. So if you have a unicellular organism, it on its own does all the functions of life. But if you have a multicellular organism, it can work together to do the functions of life in a more effective way. So cells... A cell is just a cell, and if you have a bunch of cells, you have a tissue, and if you have a bunch of tissues, then you have an organ, and if you have a bunch of organ, then you have organ systems, and if you have a bunch of organ systems, you have an organism. So that's sort of how it works in the sense that all of this works together. Stem cells are undifferentiated. Undifferenti Stem cells are undifferentiated. I can't speak. Undifferentiated. 
undifferentiated, undifferentiated, undifferentiated. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells that can continue to divide and differentiate. I can't speak. Differentiate to other types of cells. So in this example, it's the sperm and the egg equal a zygote, and then the zygote turns into two daughter cells, and these daughter cells different differentiate to um, either on the left it's a nerve cell and essentially the expression of the nerve cell specific gene that's what happened there and on the left it's a epithelial epithelial cell from the intestine and this is the expression of the epithelial epithelial cell specific gene. You don't have to know the epithelial cell. I'm, I'm just giving an example. So there are different sources for stem cells. There is embryonic cell stem cells, umbilical cord blood stem cells, and adult tissue stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. Pluripotent means that they can form most types of cells. They, the tumor risk is high, and the ethics of this is essentially the death of an embryo. But a positive is that you are increasing this patient's current conditions of life. For the embryotic I'm, what am I saying? For the umbilical cord blood is multipotent. Multipotent means can form closely related cell types. The tumor risk is low and any, there aren't really any ethical issues, but you could say like, oh, you have to store it from birth because, you know, umbilical cords. Um, for the adult tissue, it is also multipotent. Again, multipotent means can form closely related cell types. It is low, and the only issue is that it's hard to extract. So, I only mentioned pluripotent and multipotent, but there is also totipotent cells, and they can form any type of cell, um, and unipotent cells, which can form only the same type of cell. So, what are the uses of stem cells? Well, there are therapeutic uses for stem cells. So, the first example is Stargardt's disease. So, this is a hereditary disease that affects the malcula, which is something in your eye. So, how this is used is that you take embryotic stem cells and you put them in a lab to make them the needed type of cell and then you inject them back into the eye. Sounds pretty simple? Probably isn't, but that's as far as I'll take that. The second example of the therapeutic use of stem cells, I was about to say Stargardt's disease. You do not use Stargardt's disease for any therapeutic <laughs> issues. Um, but yeah, back to topic, is leukemia. So leukemia is a cancer in blood-forming cells in the bone marrow. So you do this in steps. Um, first of all, here's a funny clip of me trying to draw a human. And clearly that did not work, but back to, again, back to the topic. So the first step is to remove the stem cells from the bone marrow. And the second step is to put them in a freezer. Meanwhile, your patient goes through extreme chemotherapy they put a high dosage of chemotherapy and they give that to the patient to kill the cancer cells in the bone marrow. And then the next step is for the stem cells to be returned to the patient, which will start the production of blood cells again.
So this might seem a little bit out of place, but apparently you guys also need to know about microscopes. So, what you, luckily you don't need to know that much. I mean, you have to know how to use it, but for the test purpose, you don't have to know that much. Um, so, essentially, resolution depends on wavelengths and electron wavelengths are shorter than light wavelengths. And shorter equals better, essentially. So the shorter the wavelength, the more you will be able to see. So if you put something under your microscope, you use a light mi microscope and an electron microscope, you'll be able to see more detail and more in depth using the electron microscope. You also need to know how to calculate magnification. So magnification is the sound I meant to say. So how you calculate this is there's this formula. As you see, I drew this triangle where it says I am. The I stands for size of image. The A stands for actual size. The M stands for magnification. So if you need to find the magnification, you do I divided by A. If you need to find the size of image, you do A times M. So like if it's above and below, then you divide, and if it's next to each other, you do times. So essentially magnification equals size of image divided by actual size, and I will go through an example soon. Now, percentage change is also something you need to know. Um, this is the difference between the two divided by original value times 100. And I will also do an example. So for the example, so let's say you have a cell that is 100 micrometers. No, 100 millimeters. I changed it right there. And the magnification is times 2. Then you have to figure out the actual size. So that's the A, which means it's going to be I divided by M. The I being 100 millimeters, because that's the image size, and the M being time, the 2, <laughs> of course. So I did 100 divided by 2, which boom, boom, use your genius brain, da-da-da, is 50 millimeters. Yay. Okay. Now, for the next example for the percentage change. So, before a person weighed 100 kg and after they weighed 50. So, to do this with percentage change, you would essentially take the difference. What's the difference between 150? It's 50 kg. I don't mean the after, I mean the difference. You divide it by 100 because that's what it, the original value was, and then times 100 to get the percentage, which is 50%. Woohoo! Yay, good for us. Now you all know how to do that. Great. So there's one last thing, and then we're done. So the last thing you have to know is how to convert between millimeters, micrometers, and nanometers. So essentially all you have to remember is the number 1000. So to get from a millimeter to a micrometer, you do times a thousand. And I just realized that I'm an idiot. It goes the other way around. To get from a millimeter to a micrometer. No, I'm still right. It was times a thousand. Ignore me. So subscribe, like, comment, whatever you please. If there's something that I missed or if there's a topic you want to go through, please comment. Follow me at Johanna Frenert. And I, you probably can't read what I wrote, but that's F-R-E-N-N-E-R-T. And goodbye. Thank you for watching. Toodaloo. See you soon. I will definitely upload more, probably daily or at least weekly. Okay, bye-bye.